The resurrection is the reason why we gather every single week, week after week. If Christ was not risen, let's just close the doors. Let's forget about all this nonsense. Some of you like football. Some of you like hot dogs. I don't know. You could find better things to do if that's the case. But he is risen. And that act that happened back there is not just a one-time back there event, but through every generation, Christ has walked. Christ has built the church, the people, and he has not finished yet building. There is a catalog of people who actually saw the Lord after the fact, after he was risen. That chapter, which is in 1 Corinthians 15, which gives a great catalog of the appearing of the Lord to people like Paul, like James, like Peter. He mentions 500 other brethren, and the list goes on. So it's kind of interesting when you're reading that all these people saw the risen Christ, and I believe what they saw was not the fully glorified, because I think that would have somewhere been clear that they saw something completely different, something that looked Shekinahfied, that looked full of glory. So that's not mentioned there, but it is mentioned. This is what's so crazy. It is mentioned in the book of Revelation. John tells of what he saw. Now, for some people, they'd like to take this passage out of Revelation and make it some type of a fantasy thing. But there are some really important words. If you want to turn to the first chapter of Revelation, there are some important words that the Lord himself... Describe. So when John starts writing, by the way, he is told to write down everything. And when we read, there's some very interesting things here. He gives the description, his head and his hairs were white as like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice, the sound of many waters. Now, again, symbolic uh, words, but for example, his feet is as if they burned in a furnace. Well, that's not too far away from the way God has appeared in a diversity of ways and in many times throughout the Bible, including his, we'll call it his first real appearance after the fall, which is at the burning bush, the, bur the bush that burned that was not consumed. So there are concepts, burn in a fire, so to speak, that do not make us go, wow, that's bizarre, because God is always associated with fire. That was the same concept when we saw the children of Israel moving and this pillar of fire uh, that moved with them. The voice as the sound of many waters, and later on it'll be the voice that sounds like the voice of a trumpet. So either this is something that has the ability, many waters usually symbolizes a multitude of people, so perhaps it was gentle in its sound, or maybe it was complete in its sound. And then later on is referred to as a trumpet. In his right hand, he had seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That's nothing different, by the way, than what we are told about the Word of God in the book of Hebrews. It is a double-edged sword, right? So we've got a lot of, we'll say, parallels. But in the description right there, out of the Lord's mouth, fear not, I am the first and the last, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now, you know, if somebody appeared in front of me and said, I was, I was dead and now I'm alive and I live forevermore, I'd probably go, okay then. But uh, in this particular scenario, he's appearing to John. And if you keep reading, I think it goes straight through to, no, it pretty much ends there. He tells him to write the things which he's seen, the things which are, and the things that will be hereafter. My point in showing you this is that people who read that don't necessarily jump to this place where I'm going, that a, an imaginary pretend resurrection wouldn't have a form to describe, okay? So there's that. And then if you compare what was seen, because the language in Revelation is very Old Testament, it's very Hebraic, and there are in the book of Revelation, there are a ton of Old Testament allusions. 
uh, but in particular the description that is drawn out of Daniel chapter 7 when he's referring to the Ancient of Days. Again, these kind of confirm, and there are descriptions elsewhere that make it so that you wouldn't go, who is that or what is that? You'd say, it's without a doubt, this is the Lord appearing. So hear me out on this first part of what I'm going to say. I'm not sure why John would offer a description of what he saw if A, he didn't see it, if B, he made it up, and his lie, by the way, would be permanized by the fact that he says he is told to write the things that he saw down, which makes your lie permanent. Remember in a day when there was no computers, there's no TV, the only way thing, something is going to be permanized? In writing. So I find this very interesting that if you're going to tell a lie and you're going to put it in, on paper, you better be prepared to defend it. So we've got several of these that I could go through. If putting his lie in writing would make it permanent, that would make that his lie could be used against him and all other followers if it was a lie or could be proven to be a lie. Um, of course, we could just simply say he wrote down what he saw. That's the simpler one, right? <laughs> Easier to say. So the first thing, let me recap this very quickly. He either really saw what he saw or glorified Lord, or he was lying and made up the whole thing. My only problem with that is what is the end goal? And we could do this with each and every book of the Bible. What would be the end goal to say, I saw this, and then a whole series of events that people will, for centuries, look at in anticipation of the Lord's return? What would be the point? It's either a terribly cruel joke, or he actually saw what he saw, was instructed to write what he wrote, and that's where if somebody's going to start picking this apart, you have to decide. For me, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's too much that we can confirm in this book with other parts of the book to make it something random and made up, considering that this man was exiled, not on mainland, but on an, a tiny island. If you know where modern-day Patina is, uh, it's an island basically off Asia Minor. You're kind of headed towards the Grecian islands there. I don't know, if you could make something up so remote and then actually have it be confirmed with other parts of the Bible, good luck. That, that would be really lucky, I think. So if you also consider the fact that if John was lying about what he saw, uh, in light of how the religious people of his day looked upon Jesus Christ, obviously they crucified him. So saying that you saw the one that everybody was saying or trying to dispel that he actually rose from the grave probably wouldn't make you very popular in any area except amongst your own believers. Why write this down and circulate it? There's, there's a big question there. So you could say, well, that's not logic enough. So let me go to the real nubbin. Why should people in 2024 believe this message? Why is this life-changing? If you read the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Keep in mind, as most of you know, and you've heard me mention before, Paul was a zealous Jew. He was not a Christian. He was on a path to destroy and basically lead away in prison, punish whatever you want, folks who followed Christ. So if you really think about it, someone who was that far on the other side saying Jesus was declared to be the Son of God, this is coming out of the mouth of a Jew, declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Now, I think what I grapple with is that right there in what I just said, there is a huge problem if you don't know the story of the Apostle Paul and if you don't understand Judaism in the day of the time of Christ. See, to declare Jesus basically as risen from the dead, to declare Jesus as Lord, to declare him as Messiah, considering the religious circles, you'd have to be out of your mind. So this man here, as he starts preaching and as he starts declaring these things, to me, if I was a doubter, I would start first by looking at Saul, who became Paul, and I would scrutinize his life to figure out no one coerced him. In fact, he had everything to lose by 
looking now and saying, Christ is Lord. He had everything to lose, everything, social, economic, you name it across the board, he would lose it all, most likely. All of his associations, all of his power within those circles that he uh, frequented. So the resurrection then, we say, is proof of his atoning work and character, the, the death of Christ, his deity, and his exaltation. God gave uh, undeniable proof in the testimony that his son was divine and the living son of God by the resurrection. The only problem is that people say a resurrection cannot occur because no one's ever come back from the dead. Putting aside Lazarus, who was raised up to prove the point that Jesus had the power over the grave. That was not his, Lazarus' final resurrection. But that was done to put his power on display Read that passage out of John and, John, and Jesus makes it abundantly clear that he waited. Remember the, the sister saying, Lord, but he stinketh by this time. His body would already started decomposing. But the reason for waiting, he would be certifiably dead. There would be no one to say, oh, well, he just resuscitated or he wasn't dead after all. So there are so many proofs given to us if people would look. Most people, they don't care to look. It's, it's, it's a bother for such an important issue. In Romans 4.25, the resurrection is a certainty to our justification. Paul writes, He who was delivered up for our transgressions and raised for our justification, that last act of justification was done for us so that we might be in right standing with God up until the coming of Christ. No human being that walked the earth was in technically in the fullest right relationship. They may have been picked out by God. They may have pleased God. But no one had yet been covered by the atoning sacrifice Christ made on the cross. So let's just say there were a lot of things put into the pot to uh, build up credit for those that had already passed, those that had already been. But don't be so quick to say, how is that even possible? If you think about the concepts that I'm talking about, the resurrection as proof of our justification, it proves we are now in right standing with God if we are in Christ, is mind-boggling to a fallen person in the flesh. This is why so many people cannot, they cannot come to the conclusion that most of you, I hope, I hope all of you have come to in the sound of my voice, a life without Christ, and I'll explain this in a minute, is no life. And you might say, well, hmm, what are you talking about? I'm alive and, and I don't believe. Exactly. I'll, 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 I'll get there in a second. You see, Paul says in Romans 6, Therefore we have been buried with him through the glory of the Father that one day will be raised from the dead by the power and glory of the Father. The same thing that was promised to him is promised to us. How can I guarantee you that? I can't. You come into this world, you start walking by faith, and God says, you've got to take me at my word. I'm not going to, I've done all this for you. I'm not going to offer you any more proof. You better take me at my word, and it's a take it or leave it thing. So my frustration is how can so many people leave it if it is the most radical, life-changing event for any person who will open their eyes I know I've said, yes, the Holy Spirit has to do that. That's called prevenient grace. But let's just say, how many people do I know who profess to be kind of interested? They may even be here today in church or in a church service somewhere. But that will mark the end of it. I go to church on Easter. I go Christmas. Those are my contributions into the kingdom. That's all I do. There's a big problem with that. And, and I think my mind is now beginning to crystallize as I, I wrestled with this. How do I communicate something that's been said a thousand times, maybe a million times, but with the intent to push the message even further? And that is that the same power, the Bible says, that raised Christ from the dead shall, it doesn't say automatically, shall so dwell in you. For what? For turning to him looking unto him and saying, yes, this was the Christ, and I faith that he is Lord. 
and can lead and guide me in all things. He can guide my feet, guide my mind, heal my body, even protect me from the evil one. So if the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead shall dwell in you, my thinking is that why wouldn't people want that power, that resurrected life in them? I can't answer that, but I can tell you that when God has touched people's lives, the change is palpable. I used to think sometimes you see some people come into the church, they are the same people, they're the exact same people, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and I'm not your judge. But only you can know inside that a change has occurred. Only you can know that. I, I can know you, but only you will know. I can know for me. Somebody said, well, how do you know? Like when I chose, when I spoke on the message on being chosen and said, I am chosen, that's anybody who's in Christ. You cannot keep professing and proclaiming Christ year, day after day, month after month, year after year, unless you're the best actor or actress in the world or you really have been called by God and you love him with all your heart. Nothing in between. So you'll have people that would like to make you believe their, 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 their mouth is here, but they've never opened up their mind to see the, we'll call it the profundity of what's here, that, that in a small act of faith, your whole life can change radically. And I take the example of Peter, who we've all picked apart. We've listened to VF 166. But if you look at Peter's behavior, there was some good parts to his behavior. It wasn't all bad. It wasn't all nutty and crazy. But that mouth of his that could not actually come under control, thou art the Christ, no, Lord, be it from you, in the same, almost, almost in the same breath, he acknowledges Christ as Lord and then says, no, we don't want you to go die, even though Christ said that's what he must do. That radical change from the one who is a little bit like a scatterbrain to Mr. Pentecost, who preaches the message with such simplicity, but with eloquence. You tell me, if you study the man in the New Testament, Peter, that that is the same man before and after, and I'll tell you, you haven't read what I've read. You got the same thing as I said with the Apostle Paul, who's going to, his whole program is to capture Christians and lead them away, whether to imprison them, torture them, do them harm, who knows? There are some big changes. And this is my other issue. We're talking about an event that has not stopped changing lives, yet people, I, I'm seeing this more and more, people coming into the church who do not realize that the same power that basically was deposited into those people who were radically changed is the same power that's at work today. Melissa Scott stands in front of you, and I don't believe in testimonies, not because I don't believe in them, but everybody has one. Some are just more this or more that, but everybody has one. Make no mistakes. Well, I don't have a testimony. Okay, well, then you're not saved, I guess. Just the fact that God found you wherever you were, opened your eyes, and made you want to listen. There's a testimony right there. But it's still mind-boggling to me because I look back at the way I used to be, my interests, even my behavior. And it's not a change that's final. It's a change that's progressive. I even showed you, and I, I'm, I'm going to refer to this again because it bears witness to something. The way I handle some things today or yesterday or last week versus the way I handled them almost, almost 20 years ago. I'm really trying to show in my heart that God has given a way for things and I don't have to act in the flesh. I don't have to do things importedly because God makes those things authentically flow through you from him. I don't need to create or invent them. So with that said, if God is still able to change people, that could mean anything from someone who is materialistic to someone who doesn't care about the things of this world. Or maybe it is a substance issue. I don't know what your issues are, and it may not be that they are issues from, from day one in your life. They could be things that have come upon you as you've lived. God is able to change you for the better. 
The great Christian writer C.S. Lewis wrote, and I quote, the New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in raising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. He is our first fruit, the pioneer of life. I love that saying, the pioneer of life. I did a translation out of the book of Hebrews that he is our pioneer. I love that. He is the pioneer of life. He has forced a door open that has been locked since the death of our first parents, Adam and Eve. He has met, fought, and beaten death and everything is different because he has done so. This is the beginning of a new creation, a new chapter in cosmic history has been opened. That is from Miracles 1947. That, see, when you're preaching the word or you're referencing Christ and something you're saying is sound, it will be timeless. This is a timeless saying. So for all those people out there that say, well, okay, I, I, I might be interested in knowing about this, where should I start? Well, I would say to you, start with the empty tomb. And I don't care which one you want to look at. Christ being raised from the dead assures us that death, sickness, suffering do not get the final word that the resurrection of Christ brings with it. For those that, they're, that can wrap their minds around what I just said, a changed life. But here's the thing. And I, I really believe if people can start looking at this in a different light, there is way too much information. If you listen to people who don't know the Bible, they say, well, there's no proof. There's way too much information in this book. And I'll repeat this challenge again. I'm going to say it now, and I'm going to repeat it at the close of the message. I challenge those people out there who have never taken the time who say, well, yeah, I want to believe, but I'm not sure, or yeah, it's just made up. I challenge you to spend 72 hours, the time that Christ professes to have been in the tomb, 72 hours of studying the evidence from this book. And you tell me if you can still have that closed mind and that do dogmatic behavior that says it can't be. That's the natural mind. That is the flesh mind saying it cannot be. But when you start reading the declaration, not just of the eyewitnesses as they saw the events unfold. And keep in mind, they wrote in different places. They weren't all huddled together, pretty much agreeing. Although there are discrepancies, those, those discrepancies prove the naturalness of their writing, that it's not coerced writing. It was not done with scheming plans. We should all say the same thing verbatim. Anyone who's going to take a look at the internal evidences in this book and then I'll elaborate and take on a bigger bird's eye view. Not just the Old, not just the New Testament. Those who are willing to investigate every prophetical reference concerning Christ, the coming of Christ, his return. And I could go on in the Old Testament. Well, we cannot talk about the future return, but what about all the prophecies that have already been fulfilled about his first coming? So if you're, if you're really wanting to look there's proof. You show me a man or a woman that is not afraid to talk about death and dying, and I will show you a person who actually knows and believes in what the Lord Jesus Christ says. You know how many Christians I meet that are scared of death? And I'm not, I'm not telling you to be a stoic. I'm saying if, if what Paul said is true, oh, death, where is your victory? If that's true, if Christ actually rose from the dead and he is the first, he's the first example of what we shall be, if you can't get to that first page, I feel sorry for you, man. You're missing out big time. Not just on, you know, these people say, well, don't you want to get to heaven? You got you to believe. If you don't believe, you're not getting in. Really? You should start thinking about heaven on earth first because the first thing that I think of is, my God, God rescued me. Now, we've used this analogy before, but let, let me try and do it again. Maybe it'll make more sense. Would you, would any of you, you can just say it now. It might not actually happen. You're driving on the freeway. You see a car flipped over. You know, you might have seconds before that thing bursts into fire. You see there's people in the car. Would you get out of your car and try and help that person out of the car? I know I would. It's crazy. I'm, I'm just a small woman. I don't think I have the power. But I know if I started stopping, other people would, you see this all the time, one person stops and the other people come out. How could you leave that person 
in a burning car? How could you, or even if you're not capable of anything else, dial 911, how could you just do nothing but keep driving? And yet people do that all the time. Now take what I just said, because most people do not think that outside of Christ, they are not in some wreck that is in flames. They do not envision, they do not envision themselves that way. They envision themselves as, I'm okay, I'm doing good, I've got a good life, everything's okay, or my life is not that great, but I'm okay. No, you are not. You are in that car that's flipped over, that's on fire. Somebody may try to right your car or rescue you. In this case, the example is Christ. And people never think every day something to that effect happens in the flesh. It also happens in the spirit. How many people have you tried telling, speaking to about the subject of the risen Christ and they just think you're a nut job, right? Well, then that makes you in good company with James and the rest of the first family of, of Jesus because they thought he was out of his mind. You see, if you read it too much just as an isolated picture, you can't see yourself. But you and I are there on every page Examples to show us that people are going to think we're crazy. Oh, yeah, go to church every Sunday? What's that for? I don't need church. I don't need anything. Good. That makes my job easier. <laughs> but let me talk about something else. Because this one is the one that I, I get the most thrown at me, the most. People say, I... I can't believe because Jesus didn't actually give a sign. He didn't give something. And then they'll go on to tell me that they actually don't want to read the Bible. You've got to wait for this. They don't want to read the Bible. I've heard this thousands of times because the story of Jonah just could not be true. No man has ever been trapped in a great fish's innards and survived. Therefore, the Bible cannot be true. Now let me show you perspective. Christ comes on the scene and they ask him for a sign and he says there will be no other sign but the sign of Jonah. The Lord himself said that. So you mean to tell me, see this is to show you how people are not thinking. Out of the mouth of the Lord he says just that sign which is symbolic of the resurrection. Three days and three nights in the great fish's mouth, belly, wherever he ended up. And the people said, well, I just can't, I can't read the Bible because that one, that one story just could not be true. And yet that is the very mention Christ says. This is the only sign and mentions Jonah. So a thinking person would say, I need to rethink this because if it came out of the mouth of the Lord and he's basically saying this is the sign, all those people that say there is no sign, I need proof, well, there's the proof. So how do you get over the Rubicon of saying, well, that can't happen? Well, you probably have to start with a miracle. And I'm not going to go through this exercise that the late Dr. Gene Scott used to go through. It's circular, you know, a miracle can't happen because miracles don't occur, therefore it's impossible. No. Miracles can happen. The problem is people have used that term so glibly and so loosely and so absurdly, and I don't even know if that's a word, but it doesn't matter. So, I said this is all like it gets tossed around so much. As I referred to the radical change in Peter, in Paul, in John, in Melissa Scott. Put your name there. Can you honestly sit here and tell me you have not been changed by knowing who Christ is, by knowing that he rose, and you, your end is not the grave? Can anybody sit here and say, I have not been changed. Nothing is different. My outlook is the same. My attitude is the same. Can anybody sit here and tell me that? Amen. Some people, I believe, sometimes I think God might be a little sadistic. I think sometimes God sees the, you know, oh, that went over there. I'm going to apply a little bit more pressure on him, squeeze him a little bit more, right? Oh, I feel that. Somebody else sitting there says, I didn't feel a thing, Right? I think sometimes God chooses when he's going to put the squeeze on us. That squeeze is to mold us. Now you tell me, are you, if you don't believe he rose, 
you got an imaginary squeezer on your hands. That might be a problem. I didn't mean to make mockery there, but <laughs> that may be a problem. Now, if we are really wanting to put things upside down, there's more to this. I've heard people say, well, why should I believe in a man who professed blah, 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 and they go blah, 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 right? Okay. Because they don't read the book. They don't understand. It's confounded so many people. When Jesus made the statement before Abraham was, I am, was to say, I was there. I was there in the beginning. When we read John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, okay, that is the, the counterpiece to Genesis. In the beginning, God created. And the Hebrew shows us clearly there was that majestic plural. Jesus was there from the beginning, and the words that came out, Jesus is called the word, the Greek logos, and the words that came out, as they came out, were part of the word's creativity in the creation. So when people say, well, what proof do you have? Because it seems like he just came on the scene as a recent appearance, if you will, at the time that he supposedly lived. No, my friend, the Bible says he was there. He himself declared he was before Abraham was. Now you tell me something. Who of all the people that you can think of on the stage of human history, Buddha, Confucius, all the religious leaders, none of them have that component that they always were. They came on the scene. Muhammad's a prophet. He writes. But you can't say that Muhammad, and Muhammad never said Muhammad always was. Muhammad said he was just a man. Confucius was just a man. Buddha was just a man. They deified him after his death. So in my mind, there's only one anomaly on the stage of human history. Why wouldn't you want to look at that, even though it's so preposterous that a man came back from the dead, not just any man? But why wouldn't you take a second look? Oh, I don't know. No, the arguers. Here come the arguers. Here come the doubters. Here come the people who they've not spent any time, and they'll come in and they'll argue. Uh, I'm going to say it again. If you haven't taken 72 hours, and that's short, to look for the proof, the evidence, to pierce whether the veracity of these words are, or you can say, I don't believe any of it. That's your prerogative. But when Christ declared himself, I am the resurrection and the life, I want you to hear something in there when he said, I am the resurrection. That speaks volumes as I, as a believer in Christ. Remember, everything that Christ has promised to the believer is here in the Bible, yea and amen. So when he says he is the resurrection, my association with him by faith through faith in his accomplished, finished work lets me say I can take part of that. That becomes mine. Somebody outside of this realm that's not faithing, that's not trusting, they can't claim that. But any person in the sound of my voice, I don't care where you've been, I don't care what you've done, God doesn't care where you've been or what you've done, can claim that. But something more, the second part of this, he says, I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. That's John eleven twenty five. Christ does more than give life. He is life. I'm going to say that again because it's words and we're so used to hearing them. He is life. Even the Greek, I was going to write it out for you, but I, don't, I really don't want to mess with this because it's translation and I'm, I'm, I don't want to lose anybody. But I even wrote out the words to show you in Greek multiple times, both from the passage in Revelation we looked at and in John eleven twenty five. 25. Same writer. He is referring to himself as the life, as alive. I was dead, I was alive. He is life itself. So when we have people come along that say, well, you can't prove and you don't know, and, and, and then they'll attack whether or not this book is real. It couldn't possibly be real. Look, I'm not, I'm not even going to try and attempt to refute that. There's an overwhelming abundance of evidence for the veracity of this book. And there is an overabundance of evidence to prove that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And somebody might say, well, you, you, can't, you can't prove that. Here, let me just say this to you. 
Uh, every year, I think, I've tried to mention Simon Greenleaf. He is single-handedly, uh, he made a great contribution into the body of Christ. He was one of the founders of Harvard Law School. And if you read his book, it is written like a lawyer, because Harvard Law, right? It's written like a lawyer in a courtroom to prepare the evidence that must be scrutinized to come to a conclusion. And his conclusion, when you read that particular book from Simon Greenleaf, I'm telling you something, you will walk away probably with a lot more questions, but it is, it is truly eye-opening. Because we're not talking about somebody who says, oh, you just got to believe, just take my word. He lays it out just as in, in such a scholarly, legal way that you're left with, it, it truly is irrefutable. So when people say, well, you need proof, Luke wrote in the opening of Acts 1-3, he says that he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And there's a Greek word in Acts 1-3. The Greek word is tekmerion. That word is the strongest word to, con to convey absolute positive beyond a shadow of a doubt proof. Remember, Luke was more of a professional. He was a doctor, a physician. So he chose his words wisely. That word speaks volumes in and of itself. I wish I had the time to do a whole bunch of translations for you on certain words. That just blows it clear out of the park. If you were looking at the way the grammar is laid out, even the bulk of the New Testament when Jesus is talking, you're going to have some hard issues to argue it couldn't be. Now, again, if you just want to say the whole thing is made up, but here's where I have issue. Um, we lived at a time when people needed proof, wanted proof. I think we're still in that time. People said, oh, no, this, this couldn't possibly be true. There is no uh, pool of Siloam. There is no this. And they start going down what doesn't exist until they unearth these places that now people can actually visit. You want to see the churches of Asia Minor, what's left of them, sit in Turkey, mostly in rubble and remains. So you're going to be hard-pressed to say this is just a, a great tapestry of fabrication. Why? Because in, in the time after the writing, start from John and move forward, I could understand the original 12, and I could understand Paul and certain others that we are, are mentioned to say, well, they were there at the beginning. They had everything to lose, so they put on a good show, and they lied, and they want everybody to believe. But what do you do with the people that came after? What do you do with the church while the church is spreading like wildfire? Are you just saying that all these people were just dumb automatons that just follow? Oh, yeah, oh, John said this. Oh, yeah, it must be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or was God actually pouring out his spirit and opening up the eyes to where people were like, yes. This is the thing we have been told we were waiting for. Except in that day, people were still people of the Old Testament of the book. We're living in a day and age where people don't even want to open up a book. Um, speaking, because I mentioned the empty tomb, I take that as an example of people to do a little bit of examination and thought process. So if you remember, Jesus is placed in the tomb, and that is after... His body is begged for. His body is released by Pilate, taken to the grave. So how many people are involved in knowing where the grave is? I'm just using this one example to show you that if you can't start thinking analytically and critically, and for the people who just say, oh, I'm, it's just a story, you've got to pierce through a lot of this stuff. So you have Pilate who gave permission for the body to be taken down and to be buried. Probably somewhere in the Roman records, there's probably a decree of such kind, which we don't know, we don't have, or we're not aware of. But you've got Pilate, and you've got Joseph of Arimathea, who is part of this party, and Nicodemus, who's part of this party of knowing where the tomb is. It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. So you think that Joseph of Arimathea wouldn't be able to guide people back to where the tomb was? Because when the body was gone, immediately the Jewish leaders said, oh, the disciples stole the body. And this whole argument is stupid. It really is stupid. And let me tell you why it's stupid. Because if the disciples stole the body, they would have had to hide it somewhere or dispose of it. 
you know, I think you could probably get away with that at some point, but at some point somebody's going to find remains and we've got great technology. The likelihood of that in, in, in terms of plausibility is pretty small. Then you've got the people that said the religious leaders took the body. Well, if they took it, they'd be parading. You know, they were such hypocrites and such pharisaical people. They would have been parading the body in the street, making a mockery out of it. So discount that. All the theories that were proposed that you've heard of here before, the women went to the wrong tomb, they couldn't have gone to the wrong tomb because they went to the tomb to prepare the body. And we have the record of Mary returning again, the following after Sabbath, to basically whether she was going to finish what she started or whether she was going to worship or whether she was going to pray, we don't know. But all we do know is that there are too many people who knew where the tomb was, too many people who were exposed to it, including the guards who were posted in front of the tomb. And you've got this giant stone, which no one person could roll away, with a seal on it, an official political seal, government seal. So now you've got somebody who issued the seal to put on the grave. You've got somebody who sealed the seal on the grave. You've got the guards standing outside. The guards, when, it's, when it comes clear to them that the sto stone has been rolled away and Jesus is not there, they don't go to Pilate first. They go to the religious leaders and tell them about that. You tell me how many people knew about the tomb and where it was and then don't come back and say, well, they went to the wrong tomb or they were confused. That is just a load, okay? That's just, scrap that one. But if you're really going to pick this apart, well, pastor, don't you know that there's two tombs and, and no one's agreed on which tomb? Well, let me just say this to you. You're probably not going to like what I'm going to say. I think both sites have importance, but one site is venerated inside of a church and the whole concept makes me think, go to the other one. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I don't care which tomb you want to pick from. They're both empty. And so when people approach this, I'm just using one dimension, the empty tomb. For example, if you were going to write a story about a man who came back from the grave, you'd probably be a little dumb to include the fact that there were angels sitting there going, hey, he's not here. I mean, if you want to be taken seriously, you're not going to write that. So it hurts the story. There are so many different ways to approach picking this apart. It hurts the credibility of the story to say that there were angels in there. It hurts the credibility of the story, and we could keep going on, but the fact of the matter is any person who's going to analyze just the empty tomb you know, that's, what a great challenge. Pick that one apart. How many people knew where the tomb was? It was known. It wasn't hidden. If you keep going, you realize that anybody who says, well, they, they were just confused or they didn't know, it's just somebody who doesn't actually know how much information is in here. And that's why I said, if you are not willing to take the time, I've said to you before, it's even, not only are you going to include angels talking and saying he's not here, but you're going to make your first eyewitness reporter to the resurrection, a woman. And that was not considered a credible witness in that day and age. And yet you're going to write that? If I was making this up, Peter was there. Peter got there first. He ran. Impetuous Peter. Ah! Right? And then he starts writing. And I, Peter, went to the tomb. If I was making it up, that's how I'd write it because it makes much more sense than putting a woman there. You've got to look at every aspect of this and you, you, you must go one way or the other, you're going to say either this is just a whole cloth fabricated lie, but it, its implications are too far because the implications spread onto the religious leaders of the day. They spread onto the Romans. They spread onto even the most insignificant players that are recounted inside the account itself. So you're hard pressed and you must walk away and make a decision. The tomb was empty because he came out of it. The tomb wasn't empty because they never placed him in it. Why do you go and record that you beg the body, record the women with the spices going to repair it? Oh, but he was never there. I'm sorry. That's, it's all woven together. I use the word tapestry because it's the only word that makes sense. Everything that I've said to you is probably like the back of the tapestry, real messy with lots of ends hanging. Turn it around and all you see is the picture of the risen Christ and why it is so hard for people to Look at the evidence. I just gave one, and we could go down the list of things to look at, scrutinize every single disciple and their behavior, their attitude, what changed. 
I don't care what you, how you want to approach this, but if you are willing to take the approach, if you're not willing to look, if you're not willing to analyze, scrutinize, then I'd say that's on you. But for those people who are here today and those people who are listening and who may listen to this on a replay, I want to leave you with a thought, and the thought is Christ has promised to return. We've started our journey into prophecy. Christ has promised to return. He's coming back. Don't think that somehow when Christ returns, people will be able to have an instant conversion. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because even to people who called his name, he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. This is the tragedy of a life without faith. This is the tragedy of people who do not, the preachers who do not want to preach this message. They want to tell you, repeat this prayer and you're saved. No, 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 no. That came from you. Don't repeat that prayer. Start learning about Christ. Start having a relationship, a real one, not some fantasy where you think, ah, God exists. You get to know him, you spend time. Why church? Well, maybe some of you are lazy and you don't have the propensity to sit and to dig. That's why God called some pastors and teachers to help open up the word of God. So if you're sitting in a church and you are not getting that food from the book, better understanding, growing, and getting that in a way, it may, be, it, may comes in a, it may come in a variety of different ways, but it must come through the word, you're in the wrong place. And if you're in the wrong place, it means you've got a problem. So all those people that rush out because they want to be part of the crowd who thinks, I'm in this big church and it's very popular and everybody loves the pastor and the pastor loves everybody. Uh, yeah. When Jesus returns... I think we're going to have some real interesting scenarios on earth. Paul said, we can live our life in the power of the resurrection. That's out of Philippians 3. And I believe that. We don't look at the Bible and say, okay, God, give me a list of things that I might do them. God, put your spirit in me that I may be them for you. Not me doing it. You through me. That is the power of to live right now the resurrected life. But when Christ returns, that's the big thing. We have enough information in this book to tell us what will happen with unbelievers, with people who have rejected, with people who deny, with people who do not and have not cared. Well, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people the minute Christ comes back, which will be a worldwide global event. Every eye shall see him. This is not some hidden thing at his return. Don't think that there won't be people rushing, Lord, Lord, Lord. And I would give them a word of advice, good luck. Because they have caricatured Christ as this milk toast. Oh, he hears the word Lord and forgive me. And all of a sudden he becomes like a pile of jello in front of that. No, he knows exactly what you did or what you didn't do. And I hate to say it like that, but that's the reality. Whether somebody exercised faith and took this word and said, yes, this is the word of God that God gave for us as a road map to get us to our final destination. I don't need the word of humankind. I need this word. I don't need people to tell me, you can. Si, si puede. No. Cristo puede, yes. I cannot. The Bible says, without him, I can do nothing. Until the church of Jesus Christ starts proclaiming that message, without him, I can do nothing. What is the world doing? They still think they're doing something and it's possible, but we know the truth. And that truth is that he is the resurrection and the life. And I pray, it is my earnest prayer. I don't even know. I asked God, show me how to say this to where it would be just more than words for people. But do you realize with every year that passes in your faith walk, with every year that you come to know him more, with every responsibility, with everything that you deal with in your life, is not for naught, it is not in vain. Christ looks on all of his children, and the thing is, are we, are we headed in his direction? Are we wanting to walk towards him? Are we even wanting to try, forgive the, this kind of 
cheesy expression, but to, to walk holding his hand? Or are we still so proud that we can't acknowledge something? We, we are doomed without him. Paul even said, if Christ is not risen, our faith is vain. But here's the thing. Too many eyewitnesses, too many changed and different people in different places, too many people from this book, forget about what happens afterwards, that show a picture, a puzzle. Each of them held a piece of it in building, both old and new, that when you step away, it is abundantly clear. God did not do this for a few people to go, let's go paint eggs. He did this so that the masses would have hope and understand that there is a plan, that very plan that was usurped by our first parents in the garden. He said, don't worry, I got you back. I will not let you stay in your state and die as a flesh pot if you'll trust me. My sins have been removed. Oh, the devil can come and remind you and talk to you about them. He gives you the wisdom and the clarity through his word. To be a child of God means I am looking to my heavenly father who provided for me and for you. So this Easter, unlike any other message I've ever delivered, this is a little bit of everything all over the place. I'm asking you to think about the example or the analogy I used of the person who's trapped in a car, it's engulfed in flames, and there's certain death there because that's what people are outside of Christ. They just don't know it. And for those, those of us who may appear to be stupid enough to run to the urgency, we ourselves cannot deliver. We are just the, the we'll call it the hand pieces or the mouthpieces for God. So in that analogy, this is why I stay in a very kind of uncomfortable state because I look around a lot of times and I see people who are trapped. They are trapped and engulfed in flames and there is no escape for them until God opens their eyes. I don't, I don't know about you, and I don't want to get too mushy and sentimental, but it's heartbreaking when I think about it. There are people I probably won't ever see again. And if you think about those people that you love, that you know, that changes the tone of living for Christ. It changes the way you look at your friends and your family if they're not saved. And I'm, I'm not telling you to be the person who's constantly trying to save somebody. I'm asking you to be the people who walk in the power of the resurrection, and that power will be instrumental. Not you, not the words you think of, not anything in your mind, but the power that Christ gives will be instrumental if those people have been preveniently woken up. You will not be thinking about, what am I, what am I saying to them? That power of the resurrection, well, we study and we have the answers, but God takes all of that and he makes... We'll call it the best slum gullion of it all, so that when it comes out, it's, it was designed for that person, not in my brain, not what I thought of, but I am not ashamed to tell people, he is risen, is not some, oh, we just declare it today. I think people should think a little differently. Live the resurrected life every day. And you'll see this most incredible thing when we are walking around and we see the world without hope. We know we have this certain hope. When we see a sick world, and there's a very sick world out there, we know Jesus is the healer of all, not just some or a few. So as I look at this, I say the challenge is both to those who, who maybe have stumbled across this program by accident, maybe in the next 72 hours or in the space of 72 hours. Take the challenge. Try and find some evidence. Approach it as, a, as if you were going to disprove the Bible, looking for problems. Oh, you'll find them. But I hate to tell you, if you're open-minded and you're truthful to yourself, you'll find that there is a lot more evidence than there is contradictions. To my audience that has already done that and they know the truth that is in Christ, I'm asking you to do something a little bit different. I'm not challenging you to look. I'm challenging you as a reminder. In everything we do, Christ takes something that seems quite ordinary and because it is placed in his hand, and whether that is the person or everything about the person, something very ordinary, and he makes it beyond that. I don't want to say extraordinary because that's almost a contradiction, but he, he takes something 
and augments it to the better. That means our outlook, our hope, our care, our concern, everything that could be encompassed in the life of a believer is a lamp under our feet. That means when we are in darkness, he is light for us. When he becomes all of that to you, a peace comes over you, the, a peace that the world does not have and it cannot have without Christ. So for my listening audience, it should mean something. It should, it should bring about something that says, Christ sees, knows my desire, my service, everything that is me or you. And he takes that, I believe, as precious fruit to him. So for the people who aren't interested in knowing about the resurrected life, I've got nothing to say to you probably. But for those that have just been fence-sitting or people say, what does it matter? The resurrection is the reason why we gather every single week, week after week. If Christ was not risen, let's just close the doors. Let's forget about all this nonsense. Some of you like football. Some of you like hot dogs. I don't know. You could find better things to do if that's the case. But he is risen. And that act that happened back there is not just a one-time back there event, but through every generation, Christ has walked, Christ has built the church, the people, and he has not finished yet building. Don't think because you see what you see out in the, out in the world, wars, rumors of wars, and everybody, oh, I'm panicking. Do not even go there. That is the peace which passes all understanding when you are walking with him in that resurrection power. I pray that this message somehow reinvigorates some of you who kind of just feel like, man, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just coasting. And for the ones who can never get to the place of opening up the book, crack it open, take my challenge. Tell me if you've come back and you said, nope, it's all a, it's just a bunch of lies, but this is where I found my lies. But I don't think that'll happen because you know what happens? Most of the people, and there's a long list of them, scholarly people, lawyers, doctors, who then subsequently turned into evangelists, who set out to disprove the Bible with great zeal, came back as hardcore believers. Knock yourself out. I'm praying to see this year, with all the turmoil that's about to take place in this land, I'm praying that this be a year where people actually start turning back to God, start thinking more about day-to-day -day living for Christ, and recognize you have no help. The government's not your help. Even your friends cannot help you. But the best friend that you will ever have is always there. He is alive. He is risen. He is Jesus Christ. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.